Hello again, Awesomers. It's me. It's your old buddy, Steve Simonson, and I'm coming back for another episode of the Awesomers.com podcast series. So what does that mean? It, this is episode 159. That's what that means. Uh, and all you have to do is go to Awesomers.com slash 159 to see today's show notes and details. And I, I will tell you, this uh, episode is about uh, the U.S. and China trade war and the so-called phase one trade deal that happened recently, uh, at least as of I re my recording here, uh, it happened last week. And I'm going to break down uh, how I see it and what I think about it and uh, at least share my own perspectives. You make your own decisions. So uh, if you want to get some show notes and details, go to awesomers.com slash 159 and you'll be able to get those right there. Now, I do want to point out that uh, I've got a bunch of links on the page that are from press and other places that um, help inform my own decision making. So let's let's start from the beginning. So first of all, on I believe it was around October twelfth, uh, and maybe it's the eleventh and twelfth, the Chinese delegation came over, and as the vice premier or you know somebody high ranking, kind of like the the second in command in China, and they negotiated negotiated on Thursday and then Friday, um, uh, along with the president of the U.S., uh, they claimed that they have a phase one uh, deal. And they don't actually have anything written down, and they certainly haven't released the text of any deal as of this recording. Um, and so I'm going to just kind of uh, give you my, my input. So the, the ultimate question is, you know, before Trump said, hey, I'm only holding out for the big deal. I'm not interested in any partial deals. Uh, but suddenly a phase one deal was just fine uh, with him. Now, obviously, he's got his own political pressures to deal with at home. So maybe this made sense. Uh, I would point out that the Japanese uh, are also in kind of a trade kerfuffle with the United States. Uh, Trump is pushing back on various things in Japan, and they also are doing a phased approach. And I think, in general, that this is a, a pretty common tactic, particularly in Asia, to just kind of go slow and just uh, let things kind of take the shape versus trying to get everything done really quick. Uh, and that certainly seems to be the case in China. They have shown uh, a lot of patience, despite the fact that their economy is probably being pretty negatively impacted uh, by the tariffs thus far. And it's not great for America, let's be clear. Uh, I'm not sure that there are winners in trade wars, but this tit-for-tat battle has, has uh, drawn blood on both sides. Let's see it. leave it at that. Now, the, my question is, is this a, an actual deal or is it just a ceasefire? Really is more academic, but here's a few things that I took away from all the press coverage and, and what we've gotten so far. So number one, ratcheting down rhetoric, right? All the, the back and forth and the who shot Johnny kind of conversations, you know, who caused this, who's the hothead, who's reasonable, who's good, who's bad, all of that stuff. Let's just ramp down the rhetoric. That's better than going farther into the abyss of, you know, we're gonna win and uh, we'll just keep raising our hackles at each other. That doesn't help. So I like this idea that, hey, let's take a more measured approach and ratchet down that rhetoric. The second, as I mentioned earlier, no formal deal has actually been inked. So we don't know what's going to get over the finish line, if anything. But the fact that the U.S. has honored its promise to waive or otherwise defer the additional 5% that was going to be added to the current, uh, one of the current batches of tariffs, which is already at 25%. So that batch, which started at 10 and went to 25%, was about to go to a total of 30, and that was going to be applied on October 15th, and the U.S. has honored its promise to waive and otherwise defer that. Um, right now, it's basically taking that off the table uh, based on the, the information we have at hand. Now, uh, the information we have at hand is not great. It's just press conferences and the related press coverage around this particular summit, this trade deal summit that happened last week. So there's a lot that we have to guess about. And nobody really knows what's been, you know, quote unquote, agreed to or not. So this is just me speculating. <laughs> the absence of information leaves me wide open to speculate. So here I go. Uh, I, I think China got something it wanted, right? That delay or waiver of that 5%, it's, it is actually meaningful. Uh, it can have an impact and it only accelerates for everybody who's fighting that battle, who watched their tariffs last year go to 10% and then to 25% in May and about to go to 30, there was a lot of panic. And 
A panic may be the wrong word. It depends on the level and your sophistication. If you panic, that's not a great strategy. Uh, it, it created a lot of actions. And even in some of the, the trade and press that was being discussed, Trump talked about, hey, nobody said you could break the China supply chain, but it's being broken right now. And I have to say there's some truth to that. Um, in many ways, Trump is an absolute loudmouth ding dong. Uh, but the reality is there are, there are some broken pieces of the Chinese supply chain happening now, or at least the disbursement of some of that supply chain into other countries, even if it's still being led by China-based companies. Now that has some potential upsides to China, it has some potential downsides to China, and same thing with the US. There's some upsides and some potential downsides to that um, kind of almost like fluidity. You know, if you push here in China on the supply chain, and things just kind of move out of the way over to Malaysia, Vietnam, or Thailand, or what have you, that there's some ups and there's some downs to that, and it's not a clear picture. But I can tell you the most sophisticated companies, the people who are playing the long game, are very much in touch with where the options are, and I may talk about some of that in my own case here in a minute. So uh, anyway, China got something it wanted. The U.S. also got something it wanted, which was a com commitment from China to uh, re-engage on buying a bunch of U.S. agricultural products to the tune, or at least the reported tune, of about $50 billion. Uh, but as I like to say, the devil's in the details. We don't know if that $50 billion is in the next three weeks or in the next 30 years. Uh, and frankly, it was uh, China was already buying, uh, by the report I recall off the top of my head, and I'm open to being wrong, it was already buying $10 or $12 billion worth of China-based products before this whole thing got kicked off. So the logical question is, if this comes over the period of a year or two years, then the US absolutely gained something. If it comes over five years, we're literally uh, treading water. Th that said, it's not the, the worst thing to just kind of shore up treading water. In fact, waiving a 5% and not rolling back any tariffs is also kind of treading water. So this is, this is what leads me to that ceasefire uh, philosophical question. So anyway, but the reality is both the U.S. and China can use the political wins on this trade for trade war front, if you will. And this is a good start, I think, for both uh, as well. Uh, the reality is the U.S. is bringing in billions of dollars in tariffs, which gives the U.S. administration some power to mitigate some of the industries that are hardest hit by the retaliatory uh, tariffs that are happening uh, on the China side. And the same... Uh, applies to China, although to a lesser extent, they're, they've added a bunch of tariffs on, and that, that means they've raised some money that they can uh, sprinkle around to some of their manufacturers, uh, or at least to the provinces who can then trickle it down to manufacturers to try to mitigate some of that impact. China has also let their currency float a lot more aggressively, which offsets still more of that um, uh, tariff impact. So there's a lot of things at play, and I've talked about in prior episodes how you should be, or at least how I negotiate on these very important fronts. Tariffs, all, all the different things to try to mitigate tariffs. It's a very specific uh, set of uh, kind of topics, and it's uh, important to talk to your supplier. The more volume you do with the supplier, the more leverage you have, and the opposite is also true. Uh, so the, the point is both China and the U.S. need some, some political wins and saving face and just getting some momentum, that's probably a good thing. Um, the, the real question is what happens next? So the U.S. has another round of tariffs set to take effect on a very large batch of consumer products, really almost all consumer products that haven't yet been hit uh, with crazy exceptions like, you know, Apple iPhones, I think, are on a waiver, right? That, that would set off. Uh, a lot of uh, pain, um, and so I think they're on a waiver. But very few companies that are not like Apple will get waivers. I know there's a lot of people saying, hey, I can you know, try to apply a waiver for you, just pay me some money and I'll, I'll get you a, a trade waiver or whatever on your product. It's very unlikely in my humble opinion, unless somebody presents me with facts that says their win-loss ratio on those uh, appeals to get exceptions to the, the tariffs, I, I think it's a long shot because the administration is sending very clear signals, buy your stuff somewhere else. So um, will the next round of negotiations eliminate or otherwise defer that, I believe it's a 10% 
set to take effect on December 15th of 2019? We'll find out. I don't know. Uh, there's other factors in play, including the African swine fever, which is decimating China and even North Korea's pork populations. This is the most popular meat there, and it's actually a huge part of their economy. And as the reports are, as much as 50% of their, their uh, swine or pork populations have been already decimated in the last five, six months. And I'll, I'll be honest, there's speculation out there that it's much higher and much worse than that. So maybe there's some potential again for uh, agriculture purchases come from the U.S. to help mitigate that because that could be highly inflation um, driving inside of China. I know these sound like crazy things that aren't connected, but it's all connected, believe me. So we also have to ask ourselves the question, what will the Hong Kong situation have to do with this trade process, if anything, short or long term? We don't know the answer. I think it matters actually uh, which administration is in office or which uh, political party is in office here in the United States. Uh, I think that the, US, the Chinese delegation is going to follow the U.S. election very closely and they will lean into or lean back from their strategies based on their own perception of will the deal get better or worse if the administration flips to the, uh, the other party, right? If Trump goes away and the Democrats come in, is that good or bad for China? I don't think there's a clear answer yet, but that's part of the formula. That's part of the calculus that goes into this, I think, on the Chinese side. And it's fair. That's a normal thing. Um, I, with Trump, you got to ask, how's the impeachment inquiry going to affect his <laughs> strategy, if there is one? Um, and by the way, it's not just China that's in play, right? I mentioned that Japan has a phasing uh, process. The EU just, uh, we went to the WTO and got $7.5 billion worth of products uh, tariffed from the EU. Uh, Turkey is about to get a whack of a billion and a half dollars or so of tariffs. There's other things happening as well, including the, the new Canada, Mexico, uh, and USA trade agreement to replace NAFTA. The question is, will Congress play politics with that? I don't know. All of this can have a, an impact. Some of it, the questions, even if they're rhetorical questions, you have to say, what will the global economy impact be from a prolonged trade war? People don't realize that, you know, if, if China's not doing very well financially, they don't buy as much stuff from Australia, right? Whatever they're importing from Australia. Um, I, I could speculate. It's probably a bunch of sheep and a bunch of beef and a bunch of, I don't know, wool and, and a bunch of other, you know, kind of agriculture, raw materials, things like that, not to mention other industrial types of things. But if China's economy is down, then Australia's economy suffers. And that's why the Australian currency hasn't been particularly strong recently. So it's, this is not just a two country battle. This is not just two parties of interest. It really does flow all the way through the entire global economy if uh, countries are at odds with each other. This is why trade situations of this nature are so very dangerous. So, and then of course, the, another question is, assuming there's a phase two, phase three deal, whatever it happens to be, will any of the existing tariffs get rolled back? And if they do, when? And if not, what does that mean for the trade uh, situation as it stands today? Will you just stay in China? I, I've talked to many, many um, Amazon sellers in particular, but private label entrepreneurs, people who build their own brands. And they're like, well, I've checked Vietnam. I've checked other countries, India, whatever. And my price in China is still better than uh, those alternatives. And that's true in many products in many cases. I myself am heading to China this very next week because China still has a big role and a big um, footprint in this world, and their efficiencies are substantially better than other countries. So we can't, we can't diminish uh, China's strength in manufacturing, supply chain management, logistics, et cetera. Every, every one of those things that they do really well are efficiencies that they get to compress excess uh, costs out of the equation which then hurts less sophisticated countries or makes them less competitive, I should say. Uh, places like Thailand, Vietnam, Malaysia, uh, Bangladesh, India, uh, Myanmar, et cetera, et cetera. The countries that are next to China are seeing a big influx of uh, new factories being su supported and, and built by Chinese um, backers. And 
you know, there's some speculation, you know, that there's going to be some migration along, uh, along that border. And I think that's going to happen either way. Um, big companies especially are very nervous about this kind of uh, heating up again in the future, even if it dies down to some extent over the next 12 months. So the point is there's a ton of things to think about. Uh, I've already shared with you awesomers out there my strategies to negotiate your prices and try to get as good a deal as you can. I've also given you the advice that you should look at the global supply chain. That's one of the things we're going to talk about this coming week in China with the group that's going is how, in fact, do you look for other places uh, to, to build your product? And what basis can you compare them? And, and, you know, basically, how do you start? What do you do? And it's, it's just kind of like detective work, honestly. You guys can all figure it out, but, uh, you know, we may cover more of that here in the future. So, uh, anyway, th that's, that's kind of my roundup. I think it's more of a ceasefire than a comprehensive deal. I don't think there's any dispute about that. I think both parties picked up a little bit of, I don't know, face-saving headlines uh, as a result of the phase one deal. And I don't, I'm not sure exactly where it's going to go from here, but I, I like the fact that there's some level of progress or some feeling that the, the rhetoric and the, the pressure on each country to respond is, is going down a bit. If they can dial down some of that pressure, I think there's more progress that can be made. So uh, anyway, this is awesomers.com slash 159. I have a handful of articles global trade articles and other things that support some of my observations and conclusions. And I can just tell you, it's a dynamic situation. I will be following it regularly. If you are doing anything to build your brand in manufacturing, whether it's in the US, China, anywhere else in the world, I think you should pay close attention to this. Even as we speak in this past seven days, I've talked to people all over the world, Poland, Portugal, Ukraine, uh, to some extent, South America, all across Asia, to try to figure out how to get different products built in a, the most economically viable way. And for any of you who think you're going to bury your head in the sand and go, well, my costs went up, but so did my competition. Your competition at some point will move uh, or at some point will have some efficiency that they do better with you uh, than you when it comes to price points. And you don't have the option to sit this one out. You got to stay engaged. So uh, get with the program, stay uh, focused and, you know, uh, contribute to your community. Definitely, you know, try to work with your suppliers to get your best deal. And uh, I wish you the very best of luck. Until next time, everybody, awesomers.com slash 159. We'll see you later.